there are possible guest speakers who may or may not make an appearance. The first one is very likely to. Um, this would be my pup Shadow. He's actually 11 months old now, so he's twice the size he is there, but his, and, and his voice is also twice the size. So um, he is known to bark into the presentation. And I have two little girls, Isla and Sky. they're uh, seven and six, and they also like to run around singing Frozen and whatnot. So um, they're getting better, but they're, um, they, they may make an intro, so be forewarned. Um, today we're going to talk about application migration made easy with Poltworks. Um, more specifically, you know, why it's different with Stateful Apps, you know, what are some of the concerns and gotchas to consider, uh, the pain doing it manually. I'll, I'll share some stories from customers, um, you know, mainly from a storage perspective, some of the ramifications, ways that, you know, you might go around it. Um, and then how a tool that we have PX backup can assist with uh, application migrations. Uh, and then finally, I'll do a demo. And that's really what you're all going to want to probably hear. Um, I'll build an app. We'll, I'll pull it down from Git. I'll, I'll deploy it. We'll, we'll, we'll put some data on it. Um, we'll take a backup. Um, and we'll move that app in its entirety with its data. Uh, to another site. Uh, we can even, if we have time, I can blow it away in the primary cluster and we can restore it um, as well. And I'll, 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 I'll try to walk you through that process as much as possible. Um, feel free to interrupt. Oh, you know what? None of you can interrupt. So there's no interrupting. Feel free to um, throw questions in the chat. Uh, Chris Banyan, who is one of my peers, he's also a solution architect at Pure. I've asked him to join in. So Chris will probably flick up um, surveys here and there, or I guess poll questions. And then I, I expect he will interrupt with any questions that, that may uh, sort of arise during the session. So feel free to, uh, to uh, dig in and I'll do my best to answer them. And if I can't answer them, I'll tell you, I'll get back to you. So why is application migration different with Staple Apps? Uh, you know, why is it difficult? And, you know, what are the risks? What are we worried about when we move, you know, maybe from Anthos onto on-prem? You know, what can go wrong? You know, if this app goes down, do 10 million customers able to access content they paid for? Uh, you know, we have to ask ourselves, you know, how might this affect our business? How might our leadership try to answer this question to customers or shareholders? You know, what are the risks? What, uh, what are the bounds of that risk? The other things you ask is, you know, how good is the documentation of all of these pieces that are slung together to deliver this app? You know, do we understand the interconnections that glue them together? You know, even if we have done it perfectly in code and we can do it over and over again, you know, the fact is, you know, there could be some information configuration linkages that are potentially unknown. You know, even, and even if they are, we might be worried that there are some, you just don't know. You know, so how do we capture those? And how do we eliminate this as a source of problems when we're performing migrations? You know, I had an interesting conversation with a customer um, probably a week ago, and they wanted to learn about Portworks. So I came in to talk to them about it. You know, they were particularly interested in backup. And in this customer environment, they used a very typical method in OpenShift for storage. Spun up a Red Hat server, virtual machine, thick provisioned it and exported NFS to the worker nodes. And then they were able to create PVCs to let developers bind storage. And now it's in production. They're just running a mission critical app that's delivered to thousands of customers in country. And now they've come to, you know, we want to back this up. And, you know, they have everything manual and everything is static. So it's a big concern, right? But they have some options. Now they can back up the NFS mounts, or they can snapshot that VM. You know, they can take infrastructure backups of worker nodes and maybe their master nodes. Most people make master nodes virtual these days. And they can try to automate that whole thing. Now, in the end, they admitted to having several hours of recovery time just for that one application. And with potentially a lot of unknown hurdles on how they might try to recover that mission critical app with an RTO of one hour. Now, none of those things I mentioned are 
application aware or even Kubernetes aware for that matter. And this is the challenge with these systems that are not designed for microservice architecture. And we can automate, we can script, we can develop workflows, just about everything. And you know, sure there's a better way that we can do this to get you back to production quickly uh, without having to have multiple platform teams online just to recover a single application. Now, Portworx was built, ha, has built an application that simplifies this process of application migrations and backups and restores. So if you're migrating an application from one cluster to another, um, or you need to be able to restore that application back to the cluster to get it back up and running. Now, I want to dig in, I'm going to take this opportunity now to sort of dig into this slide a bit and uh, or dig into this picture and let me paint the picture for you. Um, in this scenario, uh, I've got a production site and a DR site um, that are going to be used for simulating. So these are actually two on two separate vCenters um, and two separate data centers. Um, and we have a deployment of PX Backup, which is our app granular backup solution. Uh, runs in Kubernetes, runs a, it's a, a de a deployment with a bunch of pods strung together with some uh, data, uh, some storage on the back end. And we're using one of our products, Flashblade, just as an object store, as an S3 bucket to, uh, to back up to. Um, so we're gonna take, uh, oh, and I should note that both of these Kubernetes clusters, they're four node clusters, and they've got three worker nodes, and I'm actually using Portworks, um in both of these clusters. So they have are their VMs with some storage attached to them. I've deployed a single portport cluster in each data center, um, completely separate of each other, no communication other than uh, each one of these clusters is added into my backup environment. So I'm gonna show you how we're gonna be able to deploy an application. In the instance of this, this environment, um, we're actually going to pull a, uh, an application called Pet Clinic from a Git repo. And then we're going to deploy it and then uh, we'll go through this a little bit more. Now I'll go through the environment as well to show you some of the under the hood stuff. So if we go in here, got some lag here. You can see I've got two four node clusters with three worker nodes and a master node. My primary site my primary site I've got portworks running um, and I've got um, just a uh, standard Kubernetes installation. So this is sort of outside of the bounds of what I want to talk about, but I'm just going to take a moment to log into a kube cluster it's just to just to sort of show you around, just to illustrate a little bit. So I've just logged into one of the into one of the Portworks worker nodes. Um, so what we actually do is aggregate storage across um, these worker nodes. Um, and we virtualize storage and put it into a storage pool that we can then provision and present um, into containers. So read, write many and read, write once use cases. So all the common use cases. So things like elastic where multiple nodes need to share maybe pods or access to a you know, data set that they're writing to, uh, read, write once, maybe a SQL database or something like that. Um, you'll notice a whole bunch of pods in here. I will go into all of the Portworx related pods in detail in just a minute. Um, what I want to show you is um, just a little bit under the hood um, before I get into um, into the other stuff. So this is a Portworks cluster, se a separate cluster. It's not stretched. It's just a single storage cluster. I've got a single storage um, profile uh, storage pool. So in this instance, all flash disks running on a flash array. Um, we're using PX Enterprise, which is our um, our base core or our core product. 
um, and it has a bunch of components under the hood. Now you can sort of see the, the correlation. So on my right screen, you can see I've got three nodes. These are two parallel similarly built clusters. So just for reference, uh, we got three, three workers and a master. And if we look to the left, you'll see that I have stretched storage across those three worker nodes in the cluster. So there's 60 gigs, giving me about 170 um, of pool capacity that I can provision and present up to applications. And then I've got a couple of storage classes. Um, a storage class using the storage driver called Poleworks Volume, where I'm just going to be able to provision storage, and then the snapshot one. Now, if I were to go back here, you're probably like, what the heck is all this other stuff? So, you know, a lot of this stuff, this is just Kubernetes, obviously, um, but we've got some API pods, some Poleworks pods, some Stork, and some schedulers. Like, what is that, right? Why do we have those in there? Every one of those serves a different function, right? So the API and the Portworx pods, so this one, are, these are the ones I logged into. This is the one that manage the storage underneath um, uh, those worker nodes. So that raw block volume that's provisioned into a storage pool and is giving me the ability to present storage. The API pods are making API calls to the etcd. Um, the stork pods and the stork scheduler pods are pods that we use for snapshots and replication and um, specific to the volume when we wanna move a volume to another cluster or when we want to, any, any storage operation. So Stork is actually an open source runtime or operator runtime for Kubernetes. MC uses it, some local store, Kubernetes local storage uses it. Um, we leverage it with PX backup, we also leverage it with uh, synchronous and asynchronous DR. So when we do synchronous replication between clusters, um, and then in this instance, when we're backing up that application to an object store. That's some of the, to the functions. The scheduler serves the purpose of when, um, when you, the developer, want to deploy an application and you want to use a storage class, let's say that storage class is underpinned by Portworks. Um, when you deploy that, the, the scheduler is going to tell Kubernetes, hey, run this pod here where these worker nodes are, or run them as close to based on how you deploy that cluster. Maybe you've got a hyper-converged or a converged setup where everything's a storage node. So that's sort of a little bit of laying of the underpinning of uh, Portworks. Now, Stork, we deploy in all our clusters. So neat thing about that is that, um, you know, it all uses the um, Kubernetes API, so it's Kubernetes native. So you already have the very similar experience. So you're not managing a storage subsystem that's outside of Kubernetes. So it makes it very application granular. Um, gives us a lot more flexibility to manipulate um, and capture data for applications. And I'll show you a little bit that, about that later. Uh, let's see. So remember I said we're gonna deploy an app. Pet Clinic is just an app that one of my peers, it's actually, I think a lot of people use it. It's just a web front end, similar to WordPress, web front end, um, SQL DB back end. So we're gonna, we're gonna pull this code. We're just gonna do a git pull. And, um, and we'll just deploy it. Uh, What? Well, I thought we would. How many get clone? Oh, cloned. Uh, what did I? Do? Brain fart. Thanks for that. Whoever that was, I think that was Chris. All right, so. If we do a kube cuddle get storage class, remember I you, I'm going to use this storage class with this name. So we'll just go into pet clinic and validate it. There's actually two, so we'll use the one with the namespace. I think if we cap that file, 
with the namespace, we should see that this is going to use an associated name um, storage class. It's going to create create an eight gig volume. It's going to create a SQL and that for use on that SQL backend. So we'll do a kube cuddle create. And all the storage class already set is already there. Okay. So let's do a watch. There's Shadow doing something you probably shouldn't do. And I think Pet Clinic is the name of it. So we'll give this a minute to run. It's going to pull down the container images, and um, we should have this application up and running. The app's actually going to forward to um, uh, a node port on port 3033. So once we have this guy up and running, we will um, log into the site. And I'm not going to manually create data. I guess I could manually create one record just for reference, but I'm, I'm going to actually run another tool that's just going to generate some workloads. So it's going to simulate users logging on, users creating some records. I think it'll create like 50, um, 50 or so records. So we'll do kubectl get service, and we can see that I need to probably look at the namespace dash and pet clinic, and we're on triple three. So if we do a Kube cuddle get nodes minus O Y. I think we want to look at one of these. So we'll go to five five. Let's open up a browser. And if I did that right, we should find Pet Clinic. Just a very basic site, database backend. Got, I think there's 10 records in there. I'm going to add one manually just just for giggles just so you guys don't see that I'm have cheated this so I've added Andy Parsons and then I'm going to run this tool this docker tool that's going to simulate adding records it's going to add a whole bunch of just generic dumb records into it so We'll use this load testing tool, and I think I need to run this on a different node. So let's see. I want to run it on 55, I think. Right? 55. So we'll let that run for a couple minutes. I think it runs for two minutes, 180 seconds. But you should see here if I refresh the page, is it's going to create a bunch of data. I'll probably do it, let it run for a few minutes. Now I'm just up. Uh, oh, sorry. I was just going to uh, ask a quick question if it's going to take a couple of minutes to load. Yeah. What was, the, uh, what was the actual load testing script they used or load tester that you were using there? Because that might be useful for other people perhaps as well. Oh, it's just a, it's one that one of our, uh, one of our engineers wrote in house that just, it's just pulling from his per, his private, or it's not private, a public, it's just a Docker. Docker container image that's got a load test tool. So it runs a Python script. Oh, okay. um, this is a Python script that's going to go through and just create a bunch of dumb data. So it'll create like, um, if we go back in, it'll just create a whole bunch of records. I want to say it creates like 50 records. I think you can change the variables. I just, um, I find this to be just about enough time. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Yeah. So what I'm going to do now is log into um, our appliance. So remember, I showed you this screen, um, and I've got PX back up in the cloud. So I'm actually running at another cluster in another namespace. Um, and PX back is an orchestrator, so it's not actually a backup tool like in a traditional sense where you go and you know if you look at a traditional sense, you would take a snapshot of like the of that um, VM 
and you would capture all the data in there. Well, we don't need to do that, right? We don't care about the VM or everything because the whole idea is that we want to build this application in its entirety anywhere, right? So we care about the construct of the objects in the namespace. So the pods, the secrets, the replica sets, the service class, the volumes, and the uh, you know the persistent volumes and the volume claims, everything that makes up that application, everything that glues that together, that's what we care about. So that's what we back up, you know, because in in the real world, probably m m most people when they're building you know the Kubernetes cluster, it's um, it's not pets, it's cattle, right? You want to be able to rebuild a cluster from automation, so. Jenkins kicks off a job, maybe it deploys a new cluster. That way you can, you know, use health checks to redeploy that application. So we want to store the application and its data in its in its state so that we can make it portable, so we can move it. Remember, the essence of Kubernetes is that uh, you know a Docker, a Docker container will run on anything. Like I didn't run this any different here than you would in your own environment, barring I'm you know pointing to a different IP address, but that's sort of the value of Docker, right? I can I can package my application and I can run it anywhere. Well, when you have a state, that's a challenge, right? Because if you're running, you know, Ceph on one side and you're running GKE on the other side, how do you move that application from your Ceph storage to your GKE or your EBS or whatever it is? We want to make that whole process easy so that you know you can have we can extend the um, capabilities of that of stateless apps into stateful. So so let's go ahead and log in here. So PX backup is a tool that runs in a GUI. You can also manage and set up everything to run in um, the rest into in the Kubernetes API. So everything can be um, you know, scheduled and run through kubectl commands and or stort commands and manage at the API, or it can be managed in the UI. And we support token auth, um, all the most common authentication mechanisms. So we can say, you know, a user can access a namespace or a user can access a cluster. Um, or in this case, I'm the admin, I have access to all the clusters. So I can back up and restore to and from anywhere. Um, you can see I've got a couple different clusters here. I've got an EKS cluster. I've got a, and then I've got my two sites that I'm going to show today. Um, nice UI. I can be granular around things like rules, so I can add rules and sit with key value pairs and say, you know, this rule is going to um, apply to when I do maybe a SQL backup. Maybe before I take a backup of that application, I want to flush all the records to disk. Maybe I want to mark the database read only before I take an application consistent backup. You know, I can schedule that in here and I can have these as rules that anyone can use, or I can do that as this declarative statements in my uh, in my YAML file as well, either or. We're, at the end of the day, we're just reading YAMLs. We just put it in a nice GUI for you. Um, we're writing, as I said, to an S3 bucket. Um, I am actually using our flash blade. Um, we're just pulling S3 configuration um, variables. So like access keys and stuff like that. And then I can use that bucket to back up and restore any application. So for in instance, this pet clinic application, I can put it wherever I want. And I can put it in the same state. So you'll see there's a whole bunch of records. We'll just see if this is finished now. No, it's still running. Oh, it's done. Well, it's done, it's created. I'm not gonna try and count, but if we pay attention and we go, this was the last record, John Jackson and Courtney Sands. So we should see a whole bunch plus Andy Parsons wherever I put this in its entirety. So what we'll do is we'll go into that cluster and I'm gonna actually select the namespace that I've created, Pet Clinic. And you'll see in here, all of the objects that make up that application, the deployment, the service, the volume claim, the config map, the persistent volume, uh, everything that's unique that makes that application so that I can use it again. We'll go in and do a backup. 
and I'm just going to call this um, Meetup Workshop Demo. Now, I've already created an S3 bucket, so I'm just going to use the bucket that I've created. Now, you'll see this CSI snapshot class, probably wondering what the heck is that. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Um, for those of you that deal, have dealt with storage um, uh, applications or are dealing with stateful apps, you'll be familiar with CSI. So open source driver that supports um, you know, snapshots, clones, things like that. So if you have a Ceph with Rook, if you have a Hitachi with the CSI, if you have a Huawei or a NetApp or an EMC or a Pure, you can leverage that storage appliances snapshotting features and let the storage be the snapshot of the data be stored on that array um, and, and be able to back up and restore to an existing cluster. For the purpose of this demo, we're actually backing up and restoring to a whole nother cluster completely separate. No, the storage is separate, the cluster is separate, the, everything's separate. It's in another data center. So we just want to back up Pet Clinic. We want to back it up. Um, I want to. I want. I want to move everything that's in there. So let's go ahead and just go ahead and create that backup. Probably take a couple minutes. It's not very big. It's about 55. You see, I've done it probably a few times for different tests. Um, about 50, 60 megs. The underpin volume that it provisioned is, I think, eight gigs. Get PV dash n pet clinic. Uh, yeah, it's eight gigs. You'll see these other volumes. Uh, I am actually running my PX backup tool in this primary Kubernetes cluster under PX backup is the namespace. So just like Portworks, um, PX backup is an application that's running in Kubernetes as well. Kubectl, get pods, dash n, PX backup. You'll see all the applications running on the back end. So we're using some etcds and some back end and the front end and then some and Postgres and SQL on the back end. Backup should be finished now. So now we have a, 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 a copy of this application and all of its data. So I wanna move it. Let's put it somewhere else. Let's put it into another cluster. So I can go in, I can do a restore. I can go and say, meetup restore, and we'll put it in site B. Now I'm just gonna do the defaults here and just restore it in its entirety. I could go and say, put it in a new namespace, um, I could do all sorts of things around, um, you know, maybe I don't want to re restore files in the database, things like that. It could be very granular. For this, we're just going to go like for like. And if I can do this fast enough, we'll do a watch. Kubectl get pods dash n pet clinic. If I did this right, should see two pods start being created. It's gonna pull down those, those container images. Um, it's going to restore that volume and all of the objects specific to running this application. So the objects and the data. This is gonna take a copy of that manifest out of Kubernetes. So it's looking at that manifest. What's everything in this manifest? Where are the, what are the runtime images? What are the secrets? And then what is the data? And we're gonna take a copy of that data and we're gonna pull it down and we're gonna glue it all together just like it was before we moved it. We'll let that go, Take it'll take a couple minutes. Now this is a different cluster, um, as I said. So if we go kubectl get nodes minus O wide, we're gonna see some different addresses. So I think you remember that we, this was starting in 54 through 50, or yeah, 54 through 57 or something like that. And this is starting in 50 through 53. So it's the same process, right? I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna restore this app. I'm gonna bring it back online. 
now it's up and running. We'll do a kubectl get service to make sure it's running on the same port, which it should be, because it's just pulling everything from the manifest that it's just restored. And pet clinic. Yep. So triple three. So we'll just hit port 52 on port 30333. And we should have, oh, I shouldn't have done that. We should have everything in this entirety. We go in here. We should have 10 generic records that the site came with, plus the one that I added manually, plus the whole bunch. I think the last two was Courtney and John. So I've just taken an application, deployed it, put a whole bunch of data on it, backed it up, and moved it with, you know, I went through a bunch of different stuff and showed you under the hood, but really two commands. So application migration with two steps. Now, this is very granular, right? I'm the admin, I have access to everything, but you're a developer. I can give you access to your namespace. I can give you access to a namespace in a couple of clusters. So you can see how you can be very granular with this. We can um, um, give you flexibility to be able to move, You know, maybe do a blue green deployment, maybe be able to roll back. Um, there's a lot of power in this. and now you probably noticed, you know, I I have um, these two on-prem clusters uh, that I showed you. I could also do this whole thing with my EKS cluster. So I could go into here and I could say we want to back something up here. I could actually back up every every application in this if this cluster, if I wanted to. Now there's nothing running in it because I've literally just spun it up a couple hours ago and I haven't really set it up yet, but the same thing. I could restore this application over to EKS just the same as I did on-prem. And likewise, we're in the reverse. So that volume that's underpinned with an EBS volume or a GKE volume or an Azure disk, I could move that application back on-prem, host it on my flash array, host it on your NetApp, host it on pick your storage platform, because we, as I showed you, we abstract that away from the application, making it very portable. And uh, yeah, that's my demo. I don't really have anything else. Um, oh, you know what? Actually, what we could do is just for giggles, let's just kill the application in here. Uh, let's do a kubectl get namespace. Now I deployed this in pet clinic. Let's kill it. Let's, let's just kill it. So that should kill everything, right? Should kill the application. It should kill the volumes. It should kill um, the pods. This should go. This should go away. We'll see how long it takes to delete this out of the system. Once it deletes it, I go back in and restore it. So, oops, my developer is a bonehead and he wrote some automation and he fat fingered it. And lo and behold, I do not have that um, anymore. Never ever experienced that, Andy. No, I never have. <laughs> I've never. <laughs> I'm sure there's a million people that have probably experienced me doing it, though. That's for sure. It's just lucky, <laughs> it's lucky that we're, that, you know, we just are well read, you know, that we know about cases like this. Well, this is for people smarter than me, then, <laughs> that can help guys like me when we're in a bind. So we got this back up. We can go right back to. Oops, and we'll just select the primary cluster. Oh, it doesn't like that. Must consist of lowercase or alpha demerit. Uh, another restore to, I don't know why it said that. Are you in a space? Yeah, I think I did. So let's just restore this application right back. And I'm not gonna do anything else. I'm just gonna go restore. 
And then I'm going to come back and hit refresh on this page when it's done. Actually, maybe we'll go like this. Every time I've blasted a system, I look this relaxed all the time. What's that? <laughs> Every time I've blasted a system, I always <laughs> look as relaxed as you do all the time. <laughs> hey, Andy, if you had two backups or three backups, could you select which backup you want to restore from? Yep, I could. I could. I could. I, you know, that's a good question. That's a good question. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I didn't even go into schedules. My definite apologies. I could schedule these backups. And I could restore from any one of the backups in my schedule. So I've got, you know, all these different ones here that these are just manual. But if I were to have scheduled, maybe I should probably schedule some so that they show. Um, absolutely. So I could schedule them and I can roll back just the same. Remember, I showed you um, if I were to go back up and go to restore. Uh, we'll just do something like this just so we can see. Uh, we could replace. Uh, so you could overwrite what you're doing, or you could restore it into like a new construct as well. So that restore just finished. That another restore. So if we go back here. Oh. It's not running yet. There we go. And then there's all of my application. That's so great. I've 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 taken an application from the cloud or wherever. I've deployed it. I wrote a crap load of data. I took a backup of it. I moved it to another Kubernetes cluster. I then destroyed my application on my primary cluster and I rolled back to exactly where I left off. Um, all with pretty easy clickety click of the mouse, which you could also do with an API as well. You could kick that off. So wherever that Kubernetes cluster might live that had PX backup, we could send an API call to that and say, hey, do this thing as easily. So. I hope you guys found it useful. Thanks for watching. Um, Chris, I don't know if there are any other questions. No other questions, Andy. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, very, very relaxed destruction and restoration. <laughs> the way it should be, right? Should I have gone like this? Would that have resonated? <laughs> 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 Lord knows the first and second time I did that, that would be what I was probably doing. Yeah, yeah, sure. This is the first time you touch the tool, right? Mm -hmm. It's lucky it just works out of the box. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's quite, I mean, it's a Helm deployment. So you do a Helm install of the application. So you pull, you have to add the Helm repo to your cluster. You do a Helm installation um, and you're pretty much off to the races with the application. And then you can, you know, glue your, cl your Kubernetes clusters in um it's actually pretty easy i mean you just go into you know add a cluster you'll give it a name um it'll give you this this config uh if i were to just go you know sort of go into one and um you'll just copy your token into here and then you can add it you have to have stork installed obviously so that you can use the um storage commands but that's it once the tool is running, you just add clusters on the, um, and you're off to the races. I didn't hear the bit that is all about, you know, cutting a check for millions of dollars to pure storage. You, you tell me that something as awesome as this is completely I mean, you gotta, free. That, obviously, you have to pay for it. Look, I know that, you know, Stateful apps probably are, in my experience in APJ, in certain regions, I think Australia is one of them. Um, a lot of people, it's probably early days. It's probably we're playing desk dev. We're sort of looking at, you know, or maybe we're running production, um, but we've got a myriad of ways that we're protecting data. This is at scale um, from a simplicity and ease of use perspective, a much more scalable, easy to use solution. There's a hundred different ways to skin the cat. I think this is probably out of all the ones I've used personally, the easiest um, and the most granular to the application. So. And yeah, take that from the most biased, you know, opinion of anybody, right? <laughs>
Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you very much. Um, oh, that's just wonderful. Thanks very much, chaps. And what we might do, if anybody's got uh, any any questions, they want to just pop up into chat, uh, just put, pop in there at any point, and we'll flick them, flick them across to the man in the hot seat. We're all quiet. Going once, going twice. I saw one. Are the backups taken for just a bunch for just for the bunch of configurations instead of data for the point in time. And GG comparing with Snapsearch, which grows. So we're, we are backing up both the configuration of the applications. Remember I said everything in the namespace. So everything that makes up that ob that, that application in the namespace, um, you know, this, uh, the secrets of config maps, the deployments, the daemon set, the replica set, all of those objects, basically essentially the manifest, right? So everything, if you were to look at a, if you were to kube cuddle edit, um, edit that deployment, you'd see that manifest. So we're going to copy that manifest, but then we're also going to snapshot the data. So we're going to take a backup of that data. We're going to back that data up to S3. So it's just going into an S3 bucket. That S3 bucket could be an appliance. It could be a Minio. It could be a flash plate. It could be um, AWS doesn't matter as long as it's an S3 bucket. Now this is an app, this is an appliance that's moving, right? Like we're just released 2.8, which is going to introduce fu um, functionality um, to give us more um, granularity. You know there will be versioning that we introduce um, with S3. There will be tiering that we try to introduce. Uh, so a lot of things that are that are, that are coming um, in future iterations. So we're going to you know. Enterprise eyes this, if you will. Hope that answers your question, Ray. Awesome. Any other questions? Any questions? I think we're all good. Yeah. Once again, th thank you very much, uh, Andy. Thank you very much to Pure Storage for helping to support our humble ventures as well. You guys rock. <laughs>